course, they have a mindset which says, I will take every advantage of the good things that come my way and will enjoy them in spite of the fact that I know that there are circumstances which I face that will be difficult. And so I suggest to you that you take a very good attitude of mind into the next year. The dollar and cents factor next year probably won't be as good for you as uh, it has been in the past. Maybe some legislation that the government, in its wisdom or lack of it, chooses to pass may restrict you in some way that uh, will not make you uh, the happiest. But that need not destroy your peace of mind nor your happiness in the faith. As far as I'm personally concerned, Lorraine and I are concerned, uh, I've decided to retire. So when you get to my age, you start to feel as though after working for 51 years of your life, not all in ministry, but uh, one starts to feel as though it's time they had a bit of a break. And uh, <coughs> so uh, we've decided that uh, this is the time. Currently, I'm on holiday till the end of January. From January on till around about the middle of June, I think, um, I am owed a good lot of time. So uh, I'll get paid until then. So uh, don't think that we're going to be poverty stricken for the next few months because uh, I'll get paid until then and get whatever allowances I have. That's what they call long service leave entitlement. Uh, and after then, I'm in the good hands of our new uh, Prime Minister and those who handle his finance, plus a few other bits and pieces that I've been able to accumulate along the way. So as far as my ministry for this church is concerned, as official minister, um, I, uh, I now uh, finish my service. Um, however, as a helper, uh, advisor, comforter, or whatever else you like to say, um, if you think I can help, don't hesitate to, uh, to let me know, get hold of me, and uh, I'll do whatever I can just the same. I won't be doing all the regular things. And uh, until our new minister arrives, which possibly will be in June, as he's coming from South Africa, has to organise his uh, immigration and all that kind of stuff, not just for himself, but for his wife and his children, um, it's going to take a little bit of time and he's going to get here, hopefully, around about the end of May or sometime through June. In the meantime, I have to put you into the good hands of uh, Gary, who's our leading elder, and he's going to uh, make sure that everything goes okay. Uh, in the meantime, um, Gary will be able to help you with most things, I think, and uh, he'll make sure things go well along with his team of elders um, you'll manage well. Of course, we will still come to Wangarei Church, but from time to time I'll be uh, going to Dargaville because I will be looking after Dargaville in the interim. And from time to time I'll be in Tikipunga, and from time to time I'll be in Kaikoui and uh, Kai Tyre and uh, Wellsford, and uh, um, they did want me to go to Oriwa and uh, Kaio. So that gives me probably about a half a dozen Sabbaths here during the year, something like that. That's the way it goes, apparently, when you are a retired minister. I'd like to say thank you for the uh, kindnesses that have been shown to me, the respect, the kindnesses, uh, and the generosity that's been shown to us while we've been here. We've uh, enjoyed our time pastoring here. I must say it's been a very good church to pastor. And uh, I would say that some of that is probably because there has been other good men here before me, and of course, because there are some inherently good people here in this church. And uh, so I think most of the credit goes to the fact that this church is made up of a lot of good people. So with those little words, let me get on to what we're really on about today. <coughs> the business of adding value. The business of adding value. You know what I mean by adding value? 
In business today, it's uh, the end thing to see if you can add value to your product before you pass it on to the next stage of commerce. So, for instance, if I own a forest, uh, the wise thing is to uh, grow my pine forest, or any other kind of forest for that matter, um, to log it with our own men and, and machinery and expertise, um, to turn those logs into a product. And that might be into 4x2 timber, or it might be into a chipboard for flooring, or particle board or whatever that you might use for making cabinets and so on. The idea is to add value to that product. So that all the way along the line, a little bit more value is added and you get a bit more money out of the process. The same thing goes in many other industries. Unfortunately, many industries in New Zealand have, uh, have closed or have been moved overseas and offshore. And so that doesn't work as well as it used to. But the idea is that you add value so that at the end of the line you get the most that can be had out of your product. And I thought maybe this has some sort of application in principle to the Christian life. It would be good if we could add to our product of the Christian life during the year and make it worth more to us during 2009 than what we made of it in 2008. And I believe that there are some ways in which we can achieve that. Make your life count for more this year than it did last year. And number one, I would suggest, <coughs> out of my uh, six points that I have here, number one, I would suggest that, first of all, we see value in ourselves. If we don't see value in ourselves, we're not going to do much to seek to improve the value. If your value is nil, you're probably going to think to yourself, how can I add to this? I'm worth nothing. I never will be worth anything. So how will I add nil to nil? In fact, that's what you will do. And you'll end up with nil. So <coughs> let's think about our own value. I often think of Martin Luther. He wrote some rather lugubrious hymns. You know what that word lugubrious means? It's a marvelous word because the sound of it, it just tells you what it's like. Lugubrious, sad, bottom lip dropping, eyes down. He wrote some rather lugubrious hymns. We don't have many of his hymns in our hymn book. Martin Luther had a low self-esteem for many, many years. As a Roman Catholic priest, he saw no pleasure and enjoyment. He saw no good in himself at all. And he spent most of his time thinking up ways how he could make himself of some worth to God and some sense of self-esteem and value to himself. And of course, we know that that uh, classic example where he climbed up the, uh, the stairs on his hands and knees and I've been there and I climbed up the stairs but I didn't go on my hands and knees because there was too much chewing gum and all kinds of stuff on the steps and, and I prefer to go on my feet anyhow. When he got to the, uh, some part of the way up these steps, uh, he uh, is recorded as having heard the voice, the just shall live by faith. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, then we will have a sense of self-worth. <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> and uh, we won't turn to all the references I have here because our time is running away so fast. <clears throat> Hebrews, James, and then 1 Peter. Uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, <clears throat> we have here a clear indication as to why we should have self-worth. 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse 9 and 10 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a chosen generation. This generation of people has been chosen by God. And as God looked down through history in his prophetic, with his prophetic eye, 
He saw a generation of people that came out of 2008, the year that, that uh, we named so that we could get some sort of relationship between ourselves and time. And uh, he saw in 2008 a people whom he could use in 2009. Not only that he could use, but that he could thrill with the message of the gospel that had been on for 2,000 years or so. He saw people there that he could make happy, people whom he could thrill with a sense of self-worth and value. And in 2009, he wants us to realize that we are a chosen generation. We are the generation of 2009. And he wants us to realize that he has chosen us. Could God have skipped a generation? God could have terminated things a long time ago so that there was no generation 2009. God has chosen us because he sees value in us. And if we don't see value in ourselves, when God has chosen us, then we must be lugubrious indeed. We are worse off than Martin Luther. We have been chosen. <coughs> God had other options, you know. Jesus said something about the stones could cry out. The stones could cry out and announce his presence, announce his kingship. The stones could cry out and announce his messiahship. The stones could cry out in 2009 and proclaim the gospel message to the world. God is not without options, even the most extreme options. God is not without other options, but he has chosen us. We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We belong to the royal family of the universe. And if that doesn't give us a sense of uh, importance, a sense of value, then what does? We need to have a sense of value. Jesus said, you are of more value than many sparrows. Well, I hope I am. I don't think many people would suggest that I'm only worth the value of a handful of sparrows. Even if you don't think much of me, please suggest that I'm worth as much at least as a pigeon or perhaps a cock pheasant, but don't just tell me I'm only worth a handful of sparrows. You know what Jesus was talking about? You see, these sparrows were actually pigeons that were taken and used for offerings. And what Jesus was saying is that you are of more value than many sacrifices. And those people understood what that meant because people had given and made sacrifices and put huge store on sacrifices and their self-worth and their value centered around their sacrifices. And those who could bring extravagant sacrifices were doing so in those days. And those who couldn't brought a, a pigeon or a turtle dove and they made that sacrifice. And Jesus says, you're worth far more than thousands and thousands of sacrifices. Sacrifice is only a means to an end. It's you that God is interested in. It's me that he's interested in. He wants us to realize that we are important. Jesus said, it's my good pleasure, children, to give you the kingdom. We are of value. You know, if we want to add some value to ourselves... Value to our spiritual experience this year, we will do so when we recognize how precious we actually are. I read a little story years ago about uh, the wise men, traditionally three of them who brought their gifts to Jesus. And none of these gifts had any idea of how valuable they were. And so they were placed there in front of Jesus and uh, Joseph and, and Mary looked at them and they knew how valuable they were. And we understand that Joseph was able to dis dispense uh, those uh, gifts uh, in bits and pieces as he needed the, the money that they would return and that's what kept them in Egypt and their journeys back and forward and to get reestablished again in Nazareth when they came back. They didn't know how valuable they were. And the story goes that the other chunks of gold 
and bottles of frankincense and pots of myrrh that were made from the same batch. <coughs> they knew how valuable they were because they saw what happened to their other little portions. And so they became more centered and more glowing on account of that. Well, of course, the story is only a myth. And somebody made it up to make a nice little bit of oratory and write a story. But I think there is some lesson to be learned. We must see ourselves in the light in which Jesus sees us. <clears throat> we are what God uses to glorify him, glorify him. So add some value to yourself next year. See yourself as a son and daughter of God, a prince and a princess of the King of Heaven. We're to recognize, number two, recognize value in the uniqueness of others. There is huge value in recognition given to others. Sometimes we hard, find it hard to give recognition to other people, to give them the recognition that is their due. First of all, we feel bad in that we, uh, we look at someone and we analyze them a little bit. You know, at a very young age, we start analyzing people, don't we? As kids, we start to work out whether mum or dad is the one that will give us the goodies. And when dad says, no, you can't have that, we wait till dad's out of the road and we go and ask mum. And mum hasn't heard what dad said and so mum gives us what we ask for. Now, next time, who are we going to go to when we want something? Well, we go straight to mum. We leave dad out in the cold. We go straight to mum because she gave us the goodies this time. So we soon start to assess and to analyse people. To recognise the value in others, it does require a little bit of analysis. But let's remember that the analysis that we do can be done in two different frames of mind. One in a frame <coughs> of assessment for growth and development and the other for the purpose of criticism in which case we are aiming to elevate ourselves and not to see the good in others. We, we are to respect and acknowledge their individuality for none of us is the same as any other. Even identical twins are not identical. <coughs> You've heard of the identical twins that were raved about by one family who uh, went and told their neighbours that they had identical twins. One was a boy and the other one was a girl. And the neighbour shook his head. But in fact, identical twins are as different in the absolute basics as any other uh, two people are. <coughs> we are to acknowledge the individuality of others, to recognize their talents, to respect their knowledge, and to learn from their experience. We can add value to our life next year by taking notice of the people around us. It'll more than likely be the church people because those are the people who are listening to this sort of thing today, but it may be others. And let's draw from their knowledge and their experience and their talents because maybe, it just may be, that God endowed them with those things. God endowed them with those things and we can benefit and add to <coughs> the value of life. Jesus was calling his disciples and he called the most motley bunch of people that you could imagine. Some were fishermen, one was a tax collector, one came from wherever, Judas, I don't know where, what his background was quite, uh, probably a professional person of some kind, but not only were they mixed in, in uh, <coughs> profession, they were certainly mixed in character, mixed in nature. And Jesus looked at them and I'm sure that if Jesus looked at the negative aspects of those disciples, he would have rejected every one of them and he would have chosen me. <laughs> I would have been far better. Maybe any one of you would have been better than that combined bunch. If 
But Jesus didn't work that way. Jesus looked at the characteristics, the talents, the gifts, the abilities, the strength of character, the strength of mind, and he saw what these men could be. And then, of course, there was uh, Barnabas and John Mark. The accounts are given to us in, uh, in Acts chapter 15. And Barnabas chose John Mark, and John Mark went on a missionary journey with Barnabas. Paul didn't want to take him. Now, Paul's supposed to be the man with all the uh, ability to assess and analyze and, and work out who's the right person for the right job and so on. Paul wouldn't have a word of it. In fact, they got so hot-headed over it that Paul went off one way with Silas and Barnabas and John Mark went the other way. Fortunately, of course, Paul changed his mind in due time and he finally, writing his letter to Timothy, he says, uh, <coughs> make sure that John Mark comes along because he's valuable to me for the ministry. And Paul started to look at the characteristics of John Mark. What a difference this can make in someone's life when they see that others have been endowed with marvelous things that only God could endow them with. And life could be a lot better. And we could add value to our experience. Number three, commit to doing some service to humanity next year or this year which will return no monetary reward. Commit to doing some service to humanity that will return no monetary reward. You say, well, I need every dollar I can get. I'm only just surviving off what the government gives me and uh, the little bit that I can earn, I need all that I could get. But the Bible emphasizes that there is great blessing in spending time with people, doing things for people that requires no monetary reward. In Acts chapter 9, we read the account of Dorcas. Dorcas, unfortunately, succumbed to some un unknown illness and died. But what do we remember Dorcas for? For the fact that she was raised to life again by the apostle, or by the hands of the apostle, or do we remember her because of the good deeds that she did? I'd say that you remember her because it's recorded that she did many good deeds and when she died there were so many people who came there who she had blessed with the, the work of her hands and the words that she had spoken to them of encouragement and comfort. We remember her for that and there's not a hint that she asked for a dollar for anything that she did or made or gave. And we think about Jesus' ministry and the apostles' ministry, the reformers' ministry and the church founders' ministry. And I don't find that they asked for a reward for whatever they did. In fact, Paul says that he didn't ask any of them for a reward, but he worked with his own hands. Well, we can't always do that in this day and age. But the emphasis is on the fact that there is a blessing in doing something for someone that we do not expect a monetary reward for. Just think for a moment, what if Jesus demanded a fee for every healing that he performed? I would say he would get rich in no time. I'll tell you why he would get rich in no time, because there were enough people around who were sick, and enough of those sick people had plenty of money who could come to Jesus and they could crowd out all his time, <coughs> paying him to be healed, but those who were poor would remain poor. The rich would do well, and the poor would do ill, and Jesus would not be the Christ portrayed in the Old Testament. Jesus gave. He didn't take. And we can be blessed too if we see real value in things other than dollars and cents. Yes, you'll have to use some. You won't survive unless you've got some dollars. The cents are not worth much today, but you'll have to have some dollars. But you will advance in value 
You will add value as you give time to humanity for which you expect no reward. Let's think about <coughs> our next one. Number four, share with others that which you have been blessed with. Share with others that which you have been blessed with. The book of Proverbs, in many instances, recommends sharing and giving. I was reading through, and I'm not going to give you these verses today, but there's a lot of them there. Sharing and giving. <coughs> and Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if you would enter into life, get rid of all the success stuff that you have. Now, what was Jesus meaning when he said, enter into life? Well, what he was meaning was, if you would enter into life to the full, if you would enter into the fullness of life, if you want to know what life is really all about, forget about getting and think more about giving. Get rid of those things that you have claimed as God's blessing to you and make them a blessing to somebody else. If you would enter into life, Jesus says, if you enter into life to the full, extend a blessing to somebody else with what you have. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, said, and we've come to know this as a proverb, haven't we? He that sows bountifully will reap bountifully. <coughs> he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And I was wondering what this blessed word was about. We use it in so many different ways, don't we? We say happy, more happy to give than to receive. I've discovered a better term for it. It's more satisfying to give than to receive. I read just recently that 79% of Christmas presents are never used. 29% of presents, Christmas presents bought at the warehouse, and the warehouse is our big uh, sort of everybody's cheapy store, I suppose you'd call it, where they have just about everything. 29% uh, of presents bought at the warehouse are returned by New Year's Day. <coughs> so you're not so blessed by receiving after all, are you? And 79% of Christmas gifts are never used. And I looked at the things that people so kindly gave me for Christmas this year, and I thought of that, and I thought, I've got to use them. And uh, believe it or not, I was able to use one the other day. And I've got some others there. I'm going to put them out where they've got to be used because I don't want to be in the 79% statistic. That upsets me. It's more satisfying to give than it is to receive. Number five, put effort. Put effort into telling people of God's plan for their eternal well-being. Matthew 5 and verse 16, Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and will glorify you as they meet you as you go down the street, right? Not right, is it? They will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Put effort into telling people about the plan of salvation. What can we do to tell others about the plan of salvation? This church is planning on doing more in the way of telling others about the plan of salvation. We want people to come to know Jesus Christ as the only method by whom they can, means by, by whom they can have eternal life. And we can do many things in order to tell others of salvation. Too often we leave it to the official church people to do the preaching and the teaching and to run the mission programs and so on. But we can all do more and we can add value to our life experience for no one gets a greater thrill than to discover that they've been talking to someone and that someone has accepted Jesus Christ as their saviour. That's the biggest thrill that you ever get. There's person-to-person -person contact the support of public efforts or of evangelistic efforts. And uh, the support for evangelistic efforts would be great if it was 100% every time we run evangelistic effort, if all the church people came. Be good for them, but it would be good for the effort as well. 
You can give out signed subscriptions. You could even decide to do some writing. You might even go in for literature distribution. You could think of many ways. Some people even thought of using web pages. And they've got something else which I think is horrible and terrible on uh, uh, computers today. Uh, but some people love it, and it's called Facebook. And uh, some of you all know about Facebook. It uh, just aggravates me something terrible. But you know what? I believe someone's going to be saved for the kingdom because of Facebook. Someone looking up you to find out what makes you tick. You could add value, no doubt about it. Remember, Jesus is the real value that we're talking about. <coughs> Jesus, <coughs> real value, does not lie in the name Jesus. If you go to South America, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of boys named Jesus. And it simply means Joshua. So the value of Jesus is not in his name, Joshua or Yeshua, if you want to be absolutely correct. It's not the fact that he's the son of Joseph and the son of Mary and the Christmas story revolves around all that. But it's rather in who he was and what he did. And if we want to add value in the year to come, we can do so by helping somebody know something about the who of Jesus. And we will add value to our life and our experience. Then I would suggest that we embark on a voyage of discovery to personal spiritual growth. Embark on a voyage of discovery to personal spiritual growth. The chances are that most of us come... <coughs> to points of stagnation in our spiritual experience. Is that true? Every now and then you come to a point where you say, this is stagnant, this is dry, this is a repeat, this is uh, not taking me forward, and uh, you have to start something different and start something new. I know that most of you would put up your hand <coughs> if I really pushed you to uh, answer that suggestion. And uh, <coughs> we go into... Uh, the situation where we spend more time reviewing what we know than investigating that which we don't know. For the last few years, I've been sort of, I'll use the word critical, but I hope you see it in the right sense, uh, critically uh, looking at our Sabbath school lessons. And you know it's good to do our Sabbath school lessons, but you know what? 99% of the time we're reviewing what we know. 99% of the time. Well, if you want to be more generous than that, call it 90%. 90% of the time we're reviewing what we know. And if you rely on the Sabbath school lesson to take you forward in your knowledge and experience, then uh, you will be disappointed because the Sabbath school lessons are really a review of what we know. They are made for the purpose of the worldwide church. And some parts of the world, they don't know what we know, and it's a great blessing to them, and it's the best thing out for them. Other parts of the world, we need to personally embark on a voyage of discovery for ourselves so that we will learn something new. You know, we can get to a point where we're just repeating old cliches. I've been to a couple of Adventist churches, and I know this is true of other churches besides Seventh-day Adventist churches, where they repeat over and over their same old cliches and you ask a question or something in a Sabbath school lesson and sure enough the answer you get is an old Seventh-day Adventist cliche, a, a stock answer that we've said for years and years. That's not a sign that we're embarking on a spiritual journey. That's a sign that we're stuck in a rut and we're not moving on. <coughs> we enjoy reading old books. That's a problem, isn't it? I look over my bookshelf now and again and I pick out those books now and then that I got enjoyment of, out of reading that someone wrote that was very good 25 or 30 years ago and I think that's fantastic. But I'm starting to think to myself, why do I have to read old books? Is it because I'm getting old? Or is it because what I find in those old books 
just sort of meshes with what's already in my mind. That's not a voyage of discovery. No, no, that's, uh, that's nostalgia. <coughs> Repeating the same old routine. You know, the scripture says that the light will shine brighter and brighter towards the perfect day. We need to go on this voyage of discovery and be following all the time, learning light for us personally. I'm not talking about the church as a whole. I'm talking about us, our personal development. Paul says to add knowledge to what? A whole lot of other things, including faith. And then he says, add knowledge. We need to be adding, adding knowledge. Get on to that journey, embark on that voyage of discovery to personal spiritual growth, and you will add value to your life in the coming year. <clears throat> Solomon said, apply your heart unto knowledge. Apply your heart unto knowledge. <clears throat> and he talks about the heart and the ears, and he connects them up with knowledge. Well, there you are. You have my six points. And the time has gone. And I was going to do something, but I'll leave you to do it in your own time, in your own way. I was going to make a seventh point, and that seventh point was yours. You can decide what you're going to do to add value to yourself in the next year. I don't want you to think in terms of, I'll do a better day's work for the boss. I'll apply for a better job. Not that sort of value. I want you to think in terms of real value. Value which would make you more a identifiable candidate for God's kingdom than perhaps you were in 2008. So that's spiritual value, isn't it? In the realm of the spiritual. I was going to ask and give you the opportunity to suggest some ideas that we might use. But our time is gone. I know that uh, <coughs> it's too hot to spend any more time here today. You better think about those things yourself. Give us some thought. Let's add some value. Don't be content just to be an ordinary Christian. Aim to be an extraordinary Christian because you've added extra value. So I invite you now to uh, stand as we sing our closing hymn, Anywhere with Jesus I Can Safely Go. And I think if you take that to heart, you will likewise add value to your experience in the year to come. It's number 508 if you are using the hymn book.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pause now to thank you for the year that has passed by. For you have given us blessings, both temporal and spiritual. But as we look forward to the year to come, we know that we will need you to give us wisdom and guidance, to lead us into that which will develop us into more spiritual people, who can appreciate your love more and will thank you more intently for the sacrifice that you have made to make it possible for our salvation. Dismiss us today with the assurance that we find our salvation in Jesus, and we can trust and be confident in him. For we pray it, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I'd just like to also, on behalf of the Wangarei Church, thank uh, Ken and Lorraine for their ministry here in Wangarei. The, over the last three years, they've done a, a, an excellent job, and uh, we just don't want to go without saying a big thank you from us all, Ken and Lorraine. God bless you and grant you good health too as you um, do all those things you've been wanting to do for a long time. Thank you.